Good afternoon. This is Rebecca Roper welcoming everyone to this wonderful um, resource and research intensive um, afternoon uh, for the PBRN Research Good Practices Report. Um, I'm glad the folks are able to join us today live at this webinar and I wanted to make note to the many presenters who work so hard at this uh, under the leadership of Dr. Neal that actually this webinar is the first webinar that um, the PBRNs have had being featured on the ARC website on the landing page. So everybody went to the ARC landing page today was encouraged to participate in this very important um, presentation. Um, so we have six presenters today. Um, they have chosen to present as a group uh, to represent a much larger group of professionals in the PBRN community who came together many times to discuss their experience and guidance and have created a wonderful 100-page resource um, that provides to us, um, both um, in the government community and uh, PBRNs at large and folks who are considering to generate PBRNs, um, the collective wisdom of these PBRN researchers in this wonderful document, PBRN Research Good Practices, um, and we will be re, um, giving you the updated link to the newest version of that particular document. Um, we will be soliciting questions. Um, it's a very tight presentation. We, if you have something um, that you want to pose to one of the presenters, we'll be looking at the questions we have and posing about, uh, we have about five minutes at the end for questions. Should you have questions um, that we are unable to answer due to time limitation, um, the um, presenters have graciously agreed to consider your questions and we would uh, get responses back to all participants at a whole. And so um, as you can see what's on the slide now, how to submit a question, you can see in your right hand panel, um, you just go to the question area, um, enter your question and select send. Um, and uh, as I said later on in the presentation, uh, we will read some of those questions provide um, uh, their responses. So um, we're ready to go to the more of the content. So as I said, there are six presenters. Um, Dr. Victoria Neal, who's the Vice Chair of Public Health Sciences at Wayne State University and an instrumental leader in PBRN. She's the director of MetroNet. She has the PrimeNet Center for which she is the director. Um, she will be joined by her colleague, Kimberly um, Campbell Voitel, who's just down the um, hall from her, also of Wayne State University, with a great deal of experimental research. She is a practice, uh, advanced practice nurse, focuses on diabetes prevention, obesity risk, and she has, I've had the pleasure of having conversations with her about various um, underserved populations in the diverse communities uh, of Detroit. So she'll be presenting afterwards. And then we have Dr. Zolt Nagakaldi, who is um, hailing from uh, Oklahoma, who always has passion and insight to share with us. And he will provide um, his expertise with us. And our fourth presenter, we're going to go across to the western side of our continent for Leanne Michaels, who is an experienced manager with the Oregon Rural Practice-Based Research Network. Um, we, you may have heard her voice uh, recently. She is engaged with our um, IRB presentations of late and has a wealth of experience that we bring to the PBRN uh, discussion community. We also have our fifth presenter, Dr. Marcy Levy, who uh, we're lucky enough, she's uh, seen patients today and we were able to have the pleasure of her first-hand presentation later on in between uh, scheduling of seeing patients. And then our sixth presenter from um, the uh, special relationship between Duke and Tennessee that is only unique to Dr. Rowena Delore. Many of you hear from her at NAPCRAC and many CTSA activities. Um, she is um, the primary care practice at Duke University Health Systems and she's very engaged in other activities and a very well respected uh, member of our community. And just to put in a plug here before I turn it over, Dr. Rowena Delore will be one of three folks. We're going to have an open call tomorrow on October the 1st to talk about different activities with respect to how a learning group can proceed on practical trials. Um, so if 
um, you're able to join us tomorrow afternoon. Again, as noted in the PBRN bi-weekly, we'd love to have you come and chat and let us know uh, some gaps that we can continue to address in the PBRN learning community. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, ask that you fill out, we're going to have a couple of poll questions. One thing that we are finding from these PBRN sponsored webinars is that a small percentage of the presenters, of the participants, are actually from the PBRN community. Others are coming from other communities, and that's great. But we have a couple of polling questions at the front end, including where you are in your maturation of your PBRN. Uh, are you considering starting a PBRN or in the first year of having a PBRN? If you could answer this, that will help us um, know who is engaged in this call. Um, and while you're answering those questions, I'll let you know that this webinar we look forward to having being a core resource um, to all uh, newbie uh, or would-be PBRNs. Um, interesting. Um, are you considering starting a PBRM or in the first year of having a PBRM? We have no, uh, not applicable for about 40% and don't know. Okay, so our next polling question is, do you consider yourself a, primarily a researcher, primarily a practicing clinician, non-researcher, both a researcher and a practicing clinician or other? So just select the category that best identifies you. Okay, and so while you're finishing uh, with that voting, I will hand over um, the control to Dr. Victoria Neal, who I had the pleasure two years ago in an early morning session of a summertime nap crack to see uh, Dr. Neal and her group who were so welcoming of everyone's participation and reflection in a, a very constructive consensus process that it really served to be an excellent way to kick off the 2013 PBRN nap crack meeting. It was an infectious um, caring about providing good care and good information to the researchers who are conducting um, research and seeking to improve their own skills and disseminate findings of those research projects that are the hallmark of PBRN. And interestingly, so uh, about 40 percent cons consider yourselves primarily a researcher, 10 uh, percent consider themselves uh, primarily a practicing clinician, non-researcher, and both a researcher and a practicing clinician, about 16 percent, and a third of you considered yourself in a different category. So that we'll explore that further. Thank you, and um, we enjoy hearing from your entire team, Dr. Neal. Thank you. I'm going to bring the slides up here. Okay. Okay. So are my slides showing? Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. It's really um, very exciting for us to finish this project on such a high note and, uh, with our constituents and, and fellow PBRN researchers. Many of you have participated in this research project which has gone on over several years with different phases. Um, so we know the forum panel, uh, the objectives, just a reminder that you, this is a, a CME providing webinar. Um, and I'm going to um, just give a couple uh, slides about the background to kind of get us all thinking about why are we doing this and how did it come about. Um, that a number of years ago I, I developed a research program based on the rationale that we needed a PBRN specific model of research governance in order to promote reliable research processes in the decentralized practice-based research setting. Um, they needed to be tailored to our own particular needs. I found that there was a lot of literature out there on conducting research in laboratory settings, that, that kind of guidance, but really nothing for us. Uh, also another uh, reason was to promote and maintain quality processes across staff, across sites, and across studies. And finally to promote uh, networks as professional research organizations. So with that rationale, 
the, the first study that I know many of you did participate in was called the Research Culture of Practice-Based Research Networks. And this was a multi-method participatory process wherein we developed a psychometrically sound self-assessment tool for networks to identify the strengths and the weaknesses in their own research practice. And uh, that resulted in a, a product that we call the Research Best Practices Checklist with 31 essential research best practices specific to the context of, of practice-based research networks. And then, uh, um, so occasionally in this presentation today, you'll hear a reference to the 31 best practices. And so that was the, the launching uh, stage for the current project that we're going to talk about, uh, which was an ARC-funded demonstration project. And now I'm going to turn over the presentation to uh, Kimberly campbell Boytel, who's going to tell you quickly about how we came to develop the, the guidelines. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. So the current project built on the uh, earlier work that Victoria just described, and really the task before us at the onset was to codify a set of operating procedures for PBRN research. And uh, we engaged a, a group of participants who were experts in the field, including direct network directors as well as their key uh, lead researchers. Uh, and we these this group uh, represented six PBRNs that were in the mature phase of their development and um, recognized uh, as highly credible and productive. It also involved uh, the support of some technical advisors, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss their uh, unique uh, contribution in a minute, but basically they assisted us with the consensus communication process and then uh, the team, the project team who helped with the managing of the timeline. Next slide, please. All right, so here's a, a colorful graphic that gives you um, a summary of the network networks, the six networks that were involved, and also the map gives you a, an idea of the geographic distribution. So uh, each brought uh, unique uh, practice perspectives, not only particular to their region, but uh, also to the uh, types of research that was practiced in their settings. Next slide. So there were three phases to the study, and um, in regards to the processes that we used, I, I think I'll just emphasize really the, the, the developmental process. So we had phase one um, lasted, the development really occurred over the time frame of 30 months, and it was followed more recently with a series of external peer review and then finally dissemination, of which this webinar is part. Next, please. Thank you. Okay. so. Uh, I would like to um, acknowledge, I think, the really critical contribution of our um, our technical advisors, a and I think for this for for uh, a methodology such as was used in this process that we really rely heavily on on a fully engaged discussion among the teams, the two uh, teams that we. Uh, uh, put together from our six PBRNs. And so if you're going to engage in a full-throated examination, an actual credible wrestling with current practice, and that includes areas of, of our strengths and as well as opportunities that, for our research improvement in our respective settings, even perhaps getting into sharing private or what sometimes is proprietary information, if we're willing to put all of that out on the table with each other and subject it to intense scrutiny and also critique and, and, and mutual growth, then quite frankly we were very gratified to have the uh, assistance of uh, two process facilitators to amplify this. And uh, just to name them, uh, Pam Sterling and Mavo Byrne, Dr. Mavo Byrne, clinician researcher, uh, both of whom were from the University of Calgary, and um, recognize experts in the use of consensus communication techniques, primarily in clinical quality improvement. And they joined uh, us in applying this expertise in group management and communication uh, to help our 
research, our expert research teams synthesize per, their pearls of professional experience into a set of research practice guidelines. So we are moving this kind of uh, innate knowledge that um, that was um, embedded in the experts out onto paper and then into um, a codified group of gui guidelines that you're going to hear about. What's important in order for this to be for this kind of um, intensive sharing to occur is that it's got to occur, it only really occurs in an environment that is equitable, where there's room for divergent views and perspectives and argument that is uh, established on trust and that the dynamic process is transparent and engaged in. So this kind of environmental um, management to allow a, a full blooming of this um, this shared work together I think was really uh, achieved by our process facilitators. Now if you look at the methods, this method slide I just love because it has some graphics and really it, the story is told in the pictures, you don't have to read any of the words. The pictures really I hope convey that that um, the methods uh, here is that it was a process of um, systematic work over time. Actually, I've, as I said, 30 months. I actually did the math. I've, we've had more than 400 meetings. That it was intensive and that it was revealing, um, uh, but as, as well as um, subject, being willing to subject one's um, views and ideas and perspectives to us, scrupulous critique and vetting within your own individual PBRN as well as within the teams and that it used multiple uh, modalities both face-to-face -face as well as uh, web and um, telephone based. So we, we pulled all of the levers for, for supporting interaction in a multiplicity of sites. Next slide please. So what do we have? And what you're going to hear, uh, that most important part of this presentation is, well, what's in these chapters? And that's what we have. We've produced four chapters. Uh, chapter one, building PBRN infrastructure. Chapter two, study development and implementation. Three, concerns the data management uh, recommendations. And finally, four is the dissemination, charges for dissemination that is part of PBRN research. And with that, I will uh, gladly introduce Schult uh, Nagi Kaldi as the next um, presenter and as a lead on Chapter 1. Schult? Thank you, Kim. It is an honor to present in the company of such dedicated investigators who worked tirelessly to develop and bring you this document. So today, I would like to give you an overview of Chapter 1 of the PBRN Research Good Practices document Chapter 1 is a compendium of good practices that we identify to help you build an effective PBR infrastructure. And I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, my colleague and co collaborator, Dr. Cheryl Aspie, who helped me develop uh, this uh, chapter. PBRs have a distinctive role in research translation, and that is to help apply evidence typically produced in controlled academic settings to applied type community practices. These translational steps require a specific infrastructure that must be established and continuously maintained. Uh, some of the characteristics of successful PBR infrastructure include multi-directional communication, participatory organization structure, and the development of a dynamic learning community. And although PBRs operate in various environments, they can be described in general based on their platform organizations. Most PBRs are directed by an academic institution some by a non-academic community organization, while others are somewhere in between, such as university and nonprofit partnerships. However, they all share the critical need of infrastructure support. Next slide, please. Chapter 1 covers five topic areas, developing and maintaining relationships, strategic planning, building a PBR and infrastructure, PBR and staffing, and PBR and funding. Next slide. We know that personal relationships represent the heart and soul of PBR and work. The purpose of relationship building is to maintain a reusable network of professional and infrastructural resources that essentially become the proverbial experimental farms laboratory that is sufficiently responsive to the needs of the members. PBRs typically need a well-known and respected community leader who can champion activities and can hold the organization together. 
PBRs frequently use a variety of channels to recruit members, but again, personal relationships have a key role in growing the organization. Even established PBRs struggle with helping their members take ownership of their organization. And the Research Good Practices document includes several examples of how this can be facilitated. Next slide, please. Periodic strategic planning is greatly helpful for iterating the mission and activities of the PBRN to the emerging needs of the organization. As an example, our most recent OKPRN Board of Directors strategic planning retreat was in 2012. We hired a professional facilitator who helped us identify and prioritize areas of need, formulate short and long-term goals, and assisted us in developing strategies to achieve these goals. We also instituted a yearly process to re-evaluate organizational goal attainment and adjust strategies if necessary. Next slide. It is essential that PBRs implement processes for the translation of needs or ideas into successful projects. Effective methods and venues that can capture needs and ideas can significantly help members participate in the work of their PBRN. Established PBRs use various electronic means to facilitate agenda setting in a participatory manner. PBRs then need a systematic member-driven approach to select and prioritize ideas that are the most relevant and could create the highest impact in clinical practice. These processes require other resources that include effective membership tracking and building a professional network of expertise. Next slide. Other infrastructural investments are also important. For example, creating information management capabilities that allow portfolio management and individual study management. A growing number of relatively low-cost informatics resources are available. RAPCAP is a good example that many academic institutions use for this purpose. PBRs are also responsible for the professional growth of individual members, which requires continuing feedback and communication of value. Several innovative and effective approaches have been developed, such as peer clinician-led academic detailing and practice facilitation. Some of these resources can be obtained freely, and I would mention the AHRQ's new practice facilitation training program as an example. Next slide. A difficult but very important aspect of PBR infrastructure is building the capacity to capture and utilize human resources. Many PBRs don't have dedicated staff and rely on the effort of academic personnel to run the organization. Directors and network coordinators are typically involved in daily decision making in addition to faculty or clinician leadership. However, some PBRs have a more developed governance structure. For example, 501c3 nonprofits have a board of directors linked to committees with clinician members and key community stakeholders in leadership positions. No matter what the structure of the PBR looks like, periodic evaluation of roles and staffing needs and new leadership training are essential for sustainability. Next slide. Perhaps the most challenging part of building a PBRN is securing long-term infrastructural funding. PBRNs today need to be more resourceful to develop and maintain their infrastructure, especially new PBRNs. As federal funders increasingly recognize that these relationship-based laboratories need the same level of investment and care that other science laboratories require, they accept the inclusion of adequate administrative support in proposals to maintain the PBRN as a key partner or collaborator. Another good practice for funding a PBRN is to strategically diversify its portfolio, leveraging not only traditional academic sources, but alternative sources as well. Uh, the success of these approaches is generally linked to the PBR's ability to market itself in the wider community, emphasizing the value it can deliver to specific organizations or programs. Next slide, please. In conclusion, let me acknowledge the following distinguished collaborators who contributed to the development of Chapter 1, noting that many of them also contributed to, the, to other chapters. Next slide. At this point, uh, let me uh, say that before we proceed to the next chapter, please complete the short poll on the screen. It will be active for 30 seconds.
are we able to launch the poll now, or should we, should we um, keep going? Oh yeah, the poll has been launched, and so we just closed it, and um, oh. the results are now displayed. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't see it. Sorry about that, no problem. Um, so here are the results, um, and you can see that the most common response option was 80% um, committees and or board structure. So I think with that, we'll turn it over to Leanne. Hi, good morning, everyone, since it's still morning here on the, on the West Coast. So Jolt was talking about um, now that we, he was talking about funding near the end of the Chapter 1 presentation. And so Chapter 2 is really about now that you're funded, it's time to implement this study. Or at least you have your fundable question ready to develop and implement. So we're going to be talking a little bit about some of what had gotten into our Chapter 2 suggestions as PBRNs are doing that work. But I first wanted to start with our poll question to have an understanding about how you guys typically, currently, are training your staff and your partners, your community partners, in conducting studies. Great. So, yeah, the one that I was thinking is probably the most true for Orbrin is the one that's got the 56% voting as well. And so we'll be talking a little bit um, during this chapter about things, strategies such as a manual of procedures. And I wanted to thank both Jeanette and Beth who helped considerably with kind of the final refinements of this second chapter. So. Um, as we were thinking about implementation, we were trying to think about what's really unique to the PBRN setting, what makes it different from, uh, from other project implementations. And really, obviously, it is the primary care um, setting. It's the, it's the dispersed um, community-based organizations that we're working with. So training requirements and, and data validation and data consistency become unique challenges in the PBRN setting and, and things that we need to be thinking about. And on the flip side, so I think we're always trying to balance how much we're asking practices to do, but we're also always trying to learn from them about what's really feasible. Um, you know, there's always the environments are always changing, especially with all of the practice transformation efforts that are taking place nationally. So what's fe what was feasible last year might not be what's feasible this year, and we need to be ready to adjust our project implementation in response to that. So however, we still need to ensure that we are collecting quality data, because without, without that, um, our research projects are going to fall flat. So um, this chapter is really designed to introduce to different PBRNs what sorts of processes you could be putting into place um, as you're implementing your projects. And their result, the result was 10 topics that you can see designed here. When Jolt was presenting Chapter 1, uh, I think there were uh, five topic areas that he went into. And so um, we're not planning to, I'm not planning to talk in great detail about each of these 10 topic areas, but you can see how comprehensive that we were trying to be in thinking about the different elements specific to PBRNs around um, implementation of projects, starting with pre-project development and identification of roles and responsibilities, which seems logical, but and it is, but it can't be overlooked. And how do you educate your staff? How do you educate your communities? We also thought it was critical to be able to have an evaluation and feedback cycle so that um, participants on a project, including your own study staff, could be evaluated for their performance so that you can have um, information for any areas that you might want to address or, or make improvements. And then there's that dreaded, uh, except no longer dreaded, manual of procedures and how that can fit into um, the, the implementation of your project, communications, plans, 
are also very critical to moving a project forward. And then we, were, we also included information around managing the quality of the data that you're collecting. We included guidelines for audits and close, study closeout as um, projects that have external sponsors as in particular will need to be ready to demonstrate those activities. So as we were talking more about this chapter um, with some different groups at a at a PBRN meeting, we realized that the pre-project activities are also pretty critical to setting up the proper um, context of the PBRN setting. So we, we recognize that it's really pretty important to, to establish expectations if your PI is outside of your PBRN. And I would say within our brim, probably at least 75% of the time that's the case. So how do you really describe what's going to be appropriate within within the PBRN setting to those that are wishing to collaborate with you. So we included some additional information uh, around that. And then once you get into the implementation itself of the project, as I had mentioned, um, pointed out earlier, it's, it's the staffing roles and responsibilities that are critical for everybody to understand what the scope is and what they are going to be expected to do. And then if you create in conjunction with that a manual of procedures, it can give very clear-cut um, guidance on how to conduct the different steps of the project, and then involving community partners as well. Next slide. Thank you. So there were a few um, unique aspects that I wanted to highlight in the chapter because, as I was saying earlier, with 10 sections, there's, it's a lot of material to cover. So I just wanted to touch on a few of the key things. And um, one of those things being a table of the PBRN's um, terms and definitions, and especially as it relates to staffing. It, it can be a whole new world of vegetable soup for an outside PI who's wishing to work with you. So it can be ways to help kind of orient a new PI, but it can also be important orientation for uh, terminology across PBRNs. There also includes in our chapter some tips around data collection. So some practical strategies to put in place for our data collection training plans in particular. And for, for our, our group, it was so reassuring to kind of learn from the other PBRNs who are participating in this process with us to help us feel like, yeah, yeah, we're thinking of all the things that we need to think of. Or having all of these voices around the table can provide you with sort of a checklist as you're coming up with training plans around data collection. And I also think it is really critical how we have identified community partners throughout um, these good practices. We really, I think our intention whenever we are working with community partners is that we have, we're working with them because of the expertise that they bring. So how can we involve them in a way that will allow them to do best what they do best? And I think we, we see our role as how, to we, how do we provide the appropriate training and support to enable them to do that while minimizing the impact. And this, this chapter includes some ideas around how to really engage with community partners, including data sharing, data analysis, all of those elements. And then there it is, the Manual of Procedures, which was, or the MOP, which was something I think I would kind of internally quiver any time we talked about this in our group because it seems so daunting. But, um, but really, it's the backbone for your protocol implementation. And there, we include all of the elements that we think are important to consider to go into a manual of procedures. Clearly, not every project needs all of them. But again, I think it can function as a nice checklist. We also um, know that many of us were working with practices or other, other collaborators. And so we've provided examples of a memorandum of understanding which I think a lot of us end up using to establish what the expectations are between the PBRN and the study site, and also if there's going to be payment. We also included some details around IRB considerations. When, how do you go about helping a practice establish a federal-wide assurance? When can you use an, an IRB authorization agreement? And some links to training modules, too, especially the, the city modules, which um, I think are sort of the gold standard, so it can help practices to, or PBRNs to think through what you need for IRB, and we also have a few samples of what's been used in other settings. And then, um, as I was mentioning, we also do some work around, um, we, some, some of us will work with um, other sponsors, 
like um, the, in the work of clinical trials. So it also includes some examples around materials for that. And I also would like to acknowledge um, those who helped to contribute to reviewing and editing this chapter, um, those named here, as well as everybody um, on the panelist side and many others who contributed to this chapter. So with that, I would like to introduce Barcy Levy at, the, at IRENE. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be on this webinar with everyone. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about um, data management and data entry and kind of that's the crux of making sure your project is scientifically uh, done well, I think, or one of the, one of the main cruxes. So um, Hannah Locks is now a um, student at Northwestern, or maybe she just finished her master's, I think. Maybe she's going on for her PhD. And um, many of the people who are also presenting today helped with this chapter. And I'm just basically presenting what the group came up with. So uh, next slide, please. So obviously, data management is critical for scientific reliability and validity of the project. So you need to make sure that you have adequate um, management of your of your data and you need to think about it in the pre-project uh, planning phases. Um, in general, PBRN research involves a lot of different types of data sources and types of data. And um, so I think two of the most common ones that we think about are qualitative data where we're asking clinicians or patients questions and getting their impressions and you could take um, probably at least two years of coursework in learning how to analyze appropriately qualitative data. And there's many different approaches for that. And then there's the more sort of standard quantitative data or numbers and means and frequencies and those kinds of things. And so as you're planning your project, you want to collect the type of data that best meets the need, that your needs and that will help answer your research questions. And um, you need to have a very systematic approach to collecting this data, transferring the data to other people that need to be able to use it, to um, data entry, and to what we call cleaning, cleaning the data, um, confirming your data is accurately entered, and storing the data. And um, this, this takes a lot of, um, I guess I would say for our group, it's taken a lot of trial and error. And um, I think that many of the ideas in, in this chapter on data management might be helpful to people that may be relatively new to, to practice-based research. Um, I think it's re very wise um, to consult with your data you're the person who's going to be analyzing your data or the people or the group that's going to be analyzing your data at, before you ever collect a single piece of data because you don't want to get to the end of the project and you know not have the information that you need to answer your research question. Everything has to go back to those research questions that are the specific aims of your project. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we, we came up with seven main topic areas. I think you know, there, there could certainly be more. And we would welcome uh, suggestions from, from those of you out in the field who, who may have may be involved in this aspect, maybe in more uh, detail than, than we are. Um, and you can, you can see what those are just by reading your screen. So next slide, please. So, um, the database has to be appropriate to the type of data and the research study that you're doing. And as was um, mentioned by both Schultz and Leanne, we're, we're generally collecting data from you know, a number of different practice-based offices. And so we have to make sure that the offices understand what type of data is being collected and that we get the information we need from those offices. And um, again, everything is driven by the research questions. 
And as you're working on this, you want to make sure that whatever you call your variables, whatever names you come up with, that you have what's called a code book. So it, that's the code book basically links the variable name with a very detailed description of exactly what the variable is. And then the um, numeric values that may correspond to certain uh, types of that variable. For example, if, you're, if one of your fields is marital status, you may choose to use a 1 if the person is married, 2 if they're divorced or separated, 3 if they're widowed, that kind of thing. But it's very important to have the state dictionary and code book and that um, if you're making changes to the codes, like maybe there's a, another category that you didn't think of and you're adding it later, that you get it in your code book. Otherwise, when you're looking at your numbers and your data, you won't maybe won't remember what four or five stood for. So that should all be written down. Um, obviously, since we're dealing with um, patient level data in many cases, we want to make sure that the data remains um, confidential and doesn't go outside of people who need to know. And um, that's usually done by means of a, a key that is where the person whose data is being used or collected, they're given an, a unique identification number. And then that link is um, in a, kept in a separate list. So for example, um, person number 101 might be John Smith. Person 102 might be Jerry Jogerst, et cetera. But, and so, so the statistician on your project may be the only person with the full link to know who those, who those people are that were in the study. And all the other study data can, can use just the 101, 102, 103, et cetera. And you need to um, think about how you're going to do your numbering system. And we have some suggestions in Chapter 3 when you get the full chapter. Um, it can get tricky when you're using you know, say you have a study that has 14 different offices and you're trying to recruit 500 patients from each office or something, you want to make sure that you can easily tell what office a given patient or participant came from and, um, you know, be able to link it back to the person um, if, if, if needed. If not needed, then um, perhaps only one or two people on your study team need to know the full need to have access to the full information. And then it's good practice, um, if you could go back one, it's good practice to any changes that you make to your data files that it have the initials or name of the person making the change and the date, just like you would with medical records. You don't make any changes without documenting those changes. OK, next slide. Thank you. Um, and so your data collection is, is, is very important, and you want to have data collecting instruments that um, collect the type of uh, material that you want. And so for practice-based research studies, um, sometimes the data is actually collected in the office if it's, a, if it's a, fun, a project that has a large amount of funding and you the investigators can afford to make contractual arrangements with an office for data collection, but then Obviously, a lot of training would need to go toward the individuals in the office who are going to be collecting the data to make sure it's standardized across offices. Um, other times, perhaps the office would send the information back to the research coordinator, the central research coordinator, and that person would be um, expected to enter the data and put it in the database. And um, so for these processes, and this is, I think, what partly what Leanne was referring to in the Manual of Procedures, you have to delineate each, each of these tasks and who, who on the team is responsible for um, each aspect because that, that will save a lot of confusion uh, later on. So if you're expecting the office to measure blood pressures and draw labs and 
send you that information, then the people in the office need training on exactly how to measure blood pressures for the research study, and they need you know, to know what kind of lab work needs to be done, and then they need to be appropriately compensated for, for their work. And I think that's you know, one of the things that's um, difficult in practice-based research studies. As Jolt mentioned, we don't, we don't always get money to maintain our infrastructure, and it's very hard to uh, keep, keep up our infrastructure to even have an annual meeting if you really have no money other than you know maybe your department contributes a little so that people can get together. Um, but with respect to, to larger research studies, if you're really trying to do multiple, multiple sites and they're spread out across a wide geographic region, um, those kind of studies um, tend to take a lot more funding than, say, a study where you're bringing people from a, a very limited geographic region into a university center for uh, data collection and data um, you know, questionnaires and whatnot. And the other thing that we've learned over the years is with any, with, you know, we're often developing questionnaires. It's very wise before you give it to your participants to test it on a number of, of people um, in, at your university with different educational backgrounds and and different perspectives, because the way you interpret a question may be totally different than the way um, another individual may interpret a question. And you, you want the questions to be answered so that they guide back to your specific aim or to your research question. And um, you also want to make sure that if you have any what, what are called skip patterns on your questionnaires, that they are appropriate, that you're not telling someone, you know, if they answer no to question number seven, that they go to question 10, and that's not really the question you want them going to, because um, you, you want to check all of that, and if you're making a lot of modifications to your questionnaire, it's very easy to kind of get mixed up on what the, uh, the skip pattern should be in your the person who's typing out the questionnaire may be just following what you had before when really they need to now go to question 12 or something. So as far as data entry, um, this should be done on an ongoing basis. You don't wait until you have all your, your questionnaires in before you ever start data entry because you want to catch, you know, ca ideally catch problems, you know, when they arise. And if if you have a faulty skip pattern, if you've started entering your data early, you may catch that and be able to revise your questionnaire for subsequent participants. And you want to make sure that the individuals on your study team understand how, what is the flow of data entry, what is the process for that. So, you know, we still use a lot of hard copy questionnaires, and if we have them Every, for every study we do, we do double data entry. We have a data verification program to make sure that the two, diff the two different people entering the data have entered the identical data and the data verification program is run. And if, there's, if one of those sheets has been entered wrong or if it's an eight-page survey, if there's some questions wrong, the data verification program will, will tell us where those discrepancies are and we can go back to the original surveys and figure out what, you know, what was entered incorrectly. Now that's more costly, obviously, than entering it only a single time, but it's considered one of the good, good research practices to do double data entry and verification. Um, obviously, now with the ability to do um, electronic surveys like Qualtrics and RedCap and other things like that you may have participants entering their own data, but as those of you who work with electronic me medical records know, it's often, if there's a drop-down menu, it's often very easy to pick an incorrect box. So um, you just have to realize where your, where your data errors may occur. Um, we, you know, for PBRN studies, data can be entered at outlying offices or centrally. 
Um, usually we are entering data here at the University of Iowa, um, even though we're collecting data from a number of different sites depending on the study. I know other PBRNs often have the practices themselves entering data. Um, we haven't gotten to that too much yet. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Here's my, thank you. Okay, so um, I touched on this earlier, but I think it's very a uh, good practice to in your large database that has information about all of your participants to basically have a unique ID, ID number uh, that links that person to their name in a separate file so that in the large database itself, if somebody were to get into that, they don't know who the individual is. So this means removing birth dates, potentially, um, obviously I think in this day and age, we would never use social security numbers for identification, although maybe some of you do, do use those. Um, we still leave in their, generally we still leave in their gender and their date of birth or year of birth, um, but we, we never have their name or address linked with, with that. And so we have this um, data, data key that's kept separately by our statistician and she is the only one that has the full key and if, if there's ever a question you know, on a given participant, you know, she's the one who has the information where we can go back to the paper file and figure out, you know, if we entered something incorrectly, which is less likely when you're doing double data entry. The two data people would have to be making the identical error to have the data entered wrong. Um, so you just have to be thinking through how you're going to make sure that there's the identification. And then um, data cleaning refers to sort of making sure your data is valid. Like for example, if you're, you come up with an individual who's uh, seven feet tall, um, maybe they really are seven feet tall or maybe there is data entry error. And one way you can help prevent, you know, some of these types of errors is to make sure when you do your database development that you have it won't let you enter uh, an improbable value that you would have to override the system uh, for certain values. Um, obviously, any study is going to have missing data, and you have to kind of plan ahead of time what you're going to do with missing data. Um, are you going to just, is, does that mean that whole participant's information goes out of your file and you don't look at it? You're not going to use it at all, or are you going to use some of their information, but just not the variable on which they had a missing missing value. And when you decide what you're going to do with a certain type of, of either missing data or for data verification, again, you should be documenting this uh, somewhere in, you know, either in the code book or in a separate file that you keep with your data because when you're going back two years later to try to run your data, it's very hard to remember all the changes that you made. So just like with medical records, documentation is really important. Next slide, please. Um, data transfer, uh, you know, you could have data being transferred from a clinic to a central site such as a university. Um, you have data transferred from paper forms maybe to a database or to a, a data file. Uh, and, and you need to think about, you know, as that data is being transferred, who might be able to access it. Um, and with all the, you know, things we see on the news about how, you know, all of the credit card numbers for people that used Target or Home Depot were, you know, taken. I mean, I think, you know, although we might think, gee, it's really unlikely somebody's going to be interested in this diabetes study, we do need to have um, encryption and data transfer mechanisms that protect an individual's privacy and confidentiality. And so this is where you need to talk with your um, IT people and there are 
you know, there are specialists in this field of data transfer. And, and most likely, if you're going to be ha doing a, conducting a large, you know, say NIH or other large funded study, you're going to need to have a section in your proposal that deals with data transfer and data security. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, we had a number of people read. Um, the chapter very carefully, and they're listed here. Um, the team members that contributed to the entire document that met with uh, Victoria and Kim and Maeve and uh, other, and we all met as, as groups twice a year in Chicago. So I thank them and um, everyone who helped with this. And like, like the little diagram there shows, it was, it was a team effort. And I believe there is a polling question for this chapter, which maybe I should have done earlier. So if you could take a few minutes or a few seconds to answer uh, this one question, um, then we can maybe spend 15 seconds describing the results and move on to chapter four. It's helpful for folks to respond to these polls. They are in part to inform the presenters today where they would be, uh, reflect about the responses, but also to help us understand what your activities are out in the field for selecting um, future uh, presentation topics or learning groups. Thank you. Okay, so I guess a little over half of you create logic parameters, and nearly half do some kind of quality assurance checks and review of the data regularly, um, about a quarter duplicate data entry. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Hi, everyone. It's Rowena. Um, I'm going to present to you Chapter 4 which initially was um, entitled Authorship Policies. And I want to thank um, Kim, who is also co-led this chapter, as well as the attendees at the 2013 PBRN meeting for letting us know that uh, um, publication is not the only way to disseminate the findings for our research. So I am going to be the last chapter presenter. And I will go quickly through this, because I think we definitely want to give you some testimonials on how um, people are using the good practices. Um, just as a background, we know that disseminating our findings is important to influence policy, build and sustain relationships, inform practice settings about emerging trends, acknowledge our stakeholders, and improve the science. And um, one thing we know is that the dissemination product is really going to vary based on the audience you want to reach. Next slide. So we have five areas that we um, talk about in this chapter, and I'll go through them quickly. Next slide. Um, the first is uh, that the product should really align and help advance the PBRN mission. Uh, I know that that seems kind of odd to think about, but when you think about how to frame your findings, you have to think about what, how should you frame the findings so that it helps the clinicians and the patients um, that are in your PBRN, as well as helps to, to support the mission statement that you've set up for your PBRN. And that means engaging the relevant stakeholders who are part of your project. Next slide. Um, and in, in doing a dissemination strategy, it's always best to start with a team. Um, obviously, you'll have the study team members, but you want to broaden your dissemination team to also those who need to know the findings. So adding clinicians, patients, community members, and dissemination experts. Um, and this team will create um, a conceptual model for what you you envision you will do with the dissemination and create the dissemination plan. Uh, and you can also break into smaller subteams. That's fine. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, so the dissemination plan should really outline the number and type of dissemination products. It should outline the timeline, the audience, um, it should map the range of topics for dissemination. So a lot of people think about just disseminating the main findings, but some people like to see papers on the process. There might be an interesting secondary paper on, on uh, engaging the community. 
So there's a whole range of topics that you can disseminate about your project. Um, and then the last thing in this plan is not only getting the message out, but also understanding the feasibility and approach to monitoring how well your dissemination plan worked. Next slide. Uh, on, in this chapter, we have a lot of uh, examples of communication standards and guidelines for you. Um, we were fortunate to get copies of the ARC dissemination guidelines, CDC, um, HHS, and of course the International Committee um, for the medical journal editors. Um, we do have some examples of authorship guidelines, uh, especially those that engage the community practices and partners at authors. And then one thing we emphasize strongly is that it, there should be an acknowledgement of the individuals, organizations, or coalitions who contributed. Next slide. Uh, and then the last point of this chapter is that somebody needs to keep track of what's going on in your dissemination plan. And in general, we think that this is going to be the PI and the project manager who will keep a master listing of all the completed and published dissemination products and hopefully post those on your PBR and website and in your newsletters. Uh, and it's always a nice touch to send a congratulatory message to the authors and contributors when something gets accepted in press or is actually published um, and give them information about how to reference the product on their resume. Next slide. So I want to thank uh, Katrina, Donahue, Doug Fernald, um, and all the others listed on this slide, um, and people who are part of the NAPCRAG PBRN work group, who really, I, this was a rewrite, basically, <laughs> from the initial draft in 2013. So um, I hope all of you get to see how we've um, changed it for the 2014 version. And the next slide. Um, this is posted on the NAPCRAIG website under the PBRN conference handouts, and the exact link to the PDF, which um, is the most updated PDF, is listed here. Um, and then I think for now we'll just go into a polling question. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers, so everybody should be able to answer this. And so our question is, um, when does your PBRN typically begin to plan for dissemination? Okay. Um, wow, that's great. So half of, almost half of you said that you really plan for dissemination at the start of the project. Um, some of us may not be for, so fortunate to be that organized, and it looks like um, many also wait mid-study or in the final month. So thank you very much for answering that poll question. And right now I'll turn this over to, um, to the folks who are doing the next slide on the benefits and utility of the best practices. Okay, thank you Rowena. This is Victoria again. Uh, that was a great presentation by everyone giving the overview of the chapters that they worked so hard on. I, I wanted to emphasize that this is a lengthy document with a lot of uh, recommendations and uh, tried and true methods. And each chapter also ha has uh, kind of an appendix that we call info links so that gives examples of templates or other, you know, specific kinds of, of, of um, guidance. So the document gives a lot of recommendations, but it also provides a lot of um, real-world examples that people from our networks are using, and I think that you'll find those to be very useful. Um, so now we're really at the discussion phase of the webinar, and I wanted to just, first of all, just open it up to um, to our, our core team in terms of how participating in this process or project has um, affected you know, their research practice, how they use it in collaborations. Um, to start, I think Leanne was going to um, tell us about how they've used it at ORPRN. Yeah, absolutely. So this has been a really great project for us. Um, as I was sort of talking about earlier, like, like many other PBRNs, we have a very diverse portfolio at ORPRN. 
Um, and a lot of times we have investigators coming to us with projects that are already developed or already funded, or we have contracts that come to us fairly rapidly. And our settings are becoming more and more diverse in addition to the primary care practices that we've worked with for many years. Now we're, we're really working a lot more with um, community groups, um, patient groups, key stakeholders around the state. So all of this diversity has started to become challenging at the operational side, and we've, we've kind of found ourselves with this urge to reinvent the wheel for every new project that we've been working on. And I think being involved with the PBRN good research practices was really reassuring to go back to kind of the roadmap for how we were going to do this research and be confident that what we were collecting, the data that we were collecting, the work we were getting done was robust. Um, and we've also been using it uh, within our P30 consortium of networks. Ours is called Metalark. And um, three of the six PBRNs that participated in creating these um, good practices are also members of Metalark. That's Irene and Ren, in addition to us. Um, but I think at the at the end of the day, I think Kim said, was it 400 meetings um, that we were involved with? We we actually enjoyed getting to meet all of the other members of the PBRNs as well. There's a lot of great knowledge that others have and we're willing to share for the greater good. So we felt really confident about what we were doing and even learned some new skills around group facilitation processes that have been really critical to our process. So we're really grateful and, and huge kudos to Kim and Victoria for leading this group, this unruly group of PBRNs. <laughs> uh, thank you. And I know that some of us have um, described our uh, developmental work w with the um, the research good practices when we're using when we're writing grant proposals and remember it, when I first came on at the beginning I was saying one of our goals was to promote PBRNs as professional research organization and I found that reviewers are interested and impressed if you will when we tell them that that you know we're using these recommended good practices uh, for is a quality control standard in our network, and um, so I just encourage you to think about, you know, pr you know how you can, you know, raise your own stature and profile as a professional research organization by, by, uh, you know, you know, working with these guidelines that that other networks have contributed to. Um, was there anyone else in our team, maybe Schultz, I, that w would want to say something about how it's affected uh, your research practice? We remember the file cabinet uh, anecdote early on. Sh you know, Schultz is always an early adapter. Yes, uh, in terms of infrastructure building, I think we've benefited from this process uh, early on uh, significantly. A couple of examples you probably can relate to the. Uh, unruliness or issues with filing both the paperwork as well as electronic documents after so many years uh, just to pull a specific study, uh, the protocol, or get a, a consent form pulled for IRB purposes. So we use this process to systematize and reorganize both the physical filing as well as the electronic filing infrastructure. We have a vast uh, file server uh, that becomes the sort of the repository of everything related to all of our projects. And it really helped us think through that and reorganize that, which is helping us now tremendously in terms of the speed and efficiency of find, finding things and documenting things. Great. Now, um, and may, there may be some other people that want to say something, but I just want to jump in here and say that now we're going to shortly move into the question and answer phase. So if anyone in the audience has a question, this is a good time if you haven't already submitted it. Um, and then I think our um, partners with the Resource Center are going to comb through those and, and uh, pose those for us. So I, if there's any more uh, comments from the panel, this is a good time, or else I'll, I'll ask Kristen to um, open the Q&A section. Do we have any other poll questions to offer? 
Yes, we do have a couple of final poll questions um, before the Q&A. And the first one that we wanted to do, we actually just wanted to redo our first poll. Um, we apologize. We um, or we, we're we're gonna we're gonna redo the first poll at the end. So first, we are we have opened this poll about how you will use the good practices. Um, so if you could respond to this now, um, will you, you implement some of the ideas, incorporate the PB, incorporate them into PBRN operations, or are you not sure yet? So we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Great, so it looks like about a third of you will be using um, the good practices for um, a couple different purposes. Um, so we'll go into our next poll, which is just about um, which chapters specifically you'd be interested in additional resources on. Um, so those are chapter one, uh, chapter two, chapter three, and four. So um, just to review, um, Chapter 1 was about building PBRN infrastructure. Chapter 2 was about study development and implementation. Chapter 3 was about data management. And Chapter 4 was about dissemination. Great, so we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the screen. So it looks like um, dissemination, Chapter 4 is a hot topic, but um, all the chapters are um, interesting from additional discussion and resources. Um, and so now we'll just do our final poll. As I mentioned, we um, we apologize. Our very first poll was missing a response option. And so we wanted to just relaunch that poll and give you guys another opportunity to vote um, on this poll. Again, I'm sorry about the missing response option at the beginning. Um, so we'll just leave it open for a little while longer to make sure everyone has a chance to respond. And while we're doing this, feel free to submit your questions um, through the question pane. You can just type them into us, and then we'll read them aloud during the Q&A. OK, great. So we'll close the poll and share this, the um, results. Great. Thank you for responding. This is very helpful. Um, and so now I will turn it over to uh, Rebecca Roper, who's going to moderate our Q&A session. Uh, so I do encourage folks just to submit under the question header any questions you have for any of our fine presenters. Um, and while we wait for some questions from the, I have a question. So Rowena reflected that um, the chapter four was revised to reflect the breadth of dissemination activities that are really pursued by PBRNs. So originally chapter four uh, was publication guidance. I was wondering if there are any issues um, that you anticipate will be evolving over time that, that maybe will um, need uh, updates to this particular doc document. If not in actuality, what are some of the bubbling issues that you think will um, impact uh, the next version, theoretically, of this document? Dr. Neal? Well, that was one of the things that we've been struggling with that we know that, you know, we want this to be a living document and we know that there are things that um, probably exist right now that could make it better. Um, and we really wanted to get some feedback discussion today, if possible, as to how to make that happen. You know, we talked about... Um, uh, you know, using a wiki type structure where people could go in and, and add their uh, recommended strategies or best practices. But I, so I'm really kind of throwing it back to the audience in terms of um, how do you think that we can continue dissemination and, and to keep this alive, making and, and it to, relevant. And to that end, um, though we don't have open mics for the all audience, feel free to um, identify yourself and uh, in the question portal and let us know your thoughts on that. And um, Dr. Neal, your project is very impressive in the, um, that it's a group effort and the um, iteration that it's had. So we can talk offline with you and your group uh, on other ways in which maybe through the PBRN uh, biweekly or some discussion we might be able to pursue this further. That would be fantastic. Um, so that, that's my thought. So um, Zolt. 
in your Chapter 1, Building PBRN Infrastructure, I was wondering if you might speak to any particular challenges or strategies that are either reflected or considered by your group for um, uh, retaining the PBRN membership and or expanding them as, as membership is so key to, uh, to having an infrastructure to um, evolve and build upon. Uh, thank you for asking that. Yes, I think uh, this is a continuing challenge even for uh, PBRs in existence for a, who were in existence in a, for a while. Um, and to us, it goes back to our mantra. Our name is actually Oklahoma Physicians Resource slash, slash Research Network, where our initial funding members insisted that resource should precede research. That might sound a little bit interesting, but this is really, at least for us, the core of the mission. It's, I, I mentioned value a lot of uh, in, in, from different perspectives, and I think delivering and creating value uh, that is very responsive to the needs of the membership is, is the, the way of, of proceeding. And of course, you know, this is just a, a sort of the approach, the rest of the approach, but there are a number of techniques and resources that one can utilize to, to make that happen. We have a very active learning community, which our members find valuable, reinforced by listservs and various communication methods. We have a participatory go governance model that is sensitive to the ideas of the members and various processes that I mentioned. In addition to that, we are really trying to look at our membership and uh, ask them in a systematic way of what the agenda of the organization should be so that they feel ownership, they, they feel that they are owners. And it, it has been challenging for us as well. Um, we experimented with various ways of uh, individual convocations, for example, or convocations with, uh, together with other organizations. We are just back to our uh, ways of having separate convocations and helping the members feel more uh, in the driver's seat. Well, thank you. Um, so we have a variety of questions um, that have come from the um, um, this question comes with respect to dem dissemination. Um, so maybe Dr. Delore, uh, you could be the first response, first responder. What do you see as the greatest challenge to dissemination among rural primary care physicians and some of the best methods of engaging them in dissemination? Dr. Delore? That's a great question. I think uh, I think that with the rural physicians, uh, it's a little bit harder to disseminate to them because they are a further distance from some of our network offices. And so um, what most people try to do is either put it in their uh, weekly electronic updates or newsletters. Um, some other strategies that have happened is sort of saving your dissemination for when you meet face-to-face -face with, um, with that community. So not trying to bombard them every week with everything that comes up, but to summarize it and prepare something um, at your next meeting, because um, most hopefully you have like uh, regular meetings with with those um, clinicians, uh, or save it for the convocation as well. But the uh, the best way to do it is to have a face to face with them and and discuss the results. But some of us don't have time to do that. But I, I think that's that's probably the most helpful. Um, avenue for some of those rural clinics that are further removed uh, is using your existing structure that you have for meeting with them um, and delivering them in you know short elevator speeches or messages that they can easily um, digest. Thank you. I could, um, add, and, and I could add one thing. This is sure. Marcy Levy with the Iowa Research Network. We we also have regular uh, newsletters. Besides having a dinner meeting once a year, we, we do newsletters about three times a year in which we summarize the main results of, of studies that have been going on in Irene. So if people are participating, then they can kind of see the summarized results of, of what, you know, what's come up. 
Great, thank you. Um, a question came in. You talked about there being three different types of PBRNs, but this question is really about could you please elaborate on the difference between a PBRN and a CBPR, which is a community-based PBRN? Dr. Neal? I think that was from Jolt's presentation, so I'm going to turf it to him. Okay. Yeah. So CBPR uh, is a research methodology as well as a community engagement uh, uh, approach that has been around maybe as long as PBRs or longer, uh, but that is focused, that approach or methodology is more focused on uh, individual or particular communities and working from and in those communities rather than just primary care practices. Now there's a very interesting convergence of the CBPR and PBR movement uh, the, whereby the uh, PBR movement is branching out to communities uh, as we hear and so there is a great potential of convergence between the two uh, and We'll have uh, various publications later on and various other certain journals will publish uh, um, on this topic and there are suggestions in terms of how to link these various uh, approaches and uh, align them. Thank you. We have a question for Dr. Um, Levy. Um, do you and it's do you have any suggestions for extracting data from multiple EHRs? Uh, there I think they mean when you're trying to get at the same information, uh, but the study sites are using uh, different EHRs. Yeah, actually I think that's a wonderful question and I think there needs to be, you know, more research on, on how to do that because I think, uh, number one, I think it can be very difficult to extract information from many EA, you know, from any given EHR and you know, if you're trying to get it out of different brands, it's it's very challenging, and I really don't. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the panel would have ideas on that, but um, we we can't even get data out of Epic, which is our EHR here, very easily. So to do it across multiple EHRs, it'd be really good if the companies would have, you know, sort of standard names for different patient variables. Okay, that's something um, we don't have the solution to either at ARC, but we do have down the hall the health IT and we have sponsored some grants uh, where the intervention is occurring in multiple EHRs and uh, the experience may be unique to the particular interventions developed, but that's something we can certainly work towards seeing if we can have a presentation about their experiences if that's of interest to the PBRN community. Um, here a question came up about specialty PBRNs, so non-primary care PBRNs. Um, uh, NAPCRAG, of course, is a primary care organization. In your breadth of interactions with so many different types of members of the clinician teams in different settings uh, for this esteemed panel, is there any um, insight or consideration or um, guidance you'd like to give those folks who are pursuing PBRN and or would modify or look to your guidance but for applying it in non-primary care settings? Do you have any thought about that, Dr. Neal? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think that really a, a lot of the guidance is applicable to a broad range of research settings. It's really not specific to primary care per se. Most of it is good research practice. You know, the gap we were trying to fill is that primary care research has some special challenges that had not been addressed in any previous guidelines, say for clinical trials done in academic medical centers. So really the, uh, some of the guidelines are, are just really good research practice especially for data management. Others, you know, like for um, Chapter 1, um, the PBRN infrastructure is really much more tailored to PBRNs um, and, and network research in general. So I think that 
um, these these uh, recommended um, good practices are, are really have something for everyone, depending on what kind of research that you're doing. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Campbell Voitau, you um, spoke about the process for the consensus determination of the content and mentioned having uh, 400 meetings, uh, which is quite a bit over a long period of time. Um, and I know it was a dedicated group of folks who participated over this long time, but might you kind of share with us, if you care to, some of your insights of of the elixir that you gave that you think compelled people to give so much of themselves to this um, publicly available document. What what do you think it was that motivated your contributors and your co-authors? Well, you know, I actually have um, watched with great interest and uh, learned an awful lot from the uh, participants, our, our team members, our colleagues who, who uh, have engaged with great energy over four years on this uh, heavy lifting. And, you know, my perspective is that we used, we tapped into the collaborative nature of PBRN researchers and clinicians. They're, I think, um, by nature collaborative people and the way the project was implemented allowed that uh, collaboration, I think, to um, full voice. And, and, you know, I hinted at the fact that at the beginning we thought we were developing, as an example here, uh, standard operating procedures for a, a very small minority of best practices uh, off of the list of 31 that, that uh, Victoria referred to early on. So we thought we would just take a subset and then uh, address um, the practices involved. However, really what happened is the task at hand became owned by the participants, by our re expert teams. They seized the task and they expanded it and um, really were much more driven to develop a comprehensive set of guidelines useful for for networks at all stages of development. So this idea that the energy and the, and the vision really came out of the teams, it wasn't a top-down kind of um, uh, hierarchical project, but more of a, a team-driven um, uh, uh, goal and, and vision. And because we were uh, operating within these um, consensus guidelines uh, uh, and, and guidance from from our consultants, uh, Pam and Maeve, I think we were able to transform the project into what the teams wanted it to be successfully. And we retained and, um, and uh, had the benefit of full participation right through to the end. And yes, 400, I think 400 is a round number. It could be, have easily uh, exceeded that when I did the quick math. Um, it was a very intense procedure, but it was owned by the participants out of the vision uh, of, for um, a larger benefit to the wider, the wider PBRN world. So it was, it was an honor to participate with the group. Oh, great. Thank you for that comprehensive um, response. And um, we have had a very full presentation today. I can see that there are more detailed questions about um, using EHRs to conduct research in the PBRNs. Um, we'll see how we can um, facilitate further conversations or learning opportunities in that area. I want to thank our very esteemed colleagues. I want to thank the folks who took the time to respond to our polling questions. That's very helpful. And um, we look forward to engaging more uh, with the PBRN community uh, at large. And we'll follow up and, and see how we can probe further um, the expertise on this panel and see how else we can keep um, the access and awareness among the community as elements of this um, comprehensive guidance document uh, may need further discussion for as a result of evolution of the field and um, as Dr. Um, Campbell Boytel said, the commitment of the um, practitioners in that field. So um, to obtain CME credit, um, please go ahead and complete the online evaluation. It's also helpful for us if um, you complete the online evaluation so we can know 
what we can do better and what uh, gaps that you would like us to address, even if you aren't going to pursue with the CME credit. And then you will be, um, uh, you will request the copy, the email, the PBRN at aptassociates.com to request a copy of your CME participation once we have it issued. So I want to thank you all. Congratulations, Dr. Neal and your entire team um, on this wonderful triumph. And as I mentioned earlier uh, in our call, uh, we're going to have something new, an open mic call uh, tomorrow on October 1st from 1 to 2 p.m. where we're going to be um, discussing um, some challenges with respect to renewing the learning group for pra pragmatic trials. Um, Dr. Rowena uh, Delore will be engaged in that one as well. She'll be joined by uh, Paul Messier and Dr. Jonathan Tobin and myself. And we will, uh, this, that'll be a small group discussion, so more are welcome to come. And we'll try to um, address some more of our challenges and see what else we can do in the PBRN Resource Center to su support the PBRN community. Um, with that, I say um, it's the end of the fiscal year. And we'll be open tomorrow for the beginning of the next fiscal year. So you all take care. Thank you. Thank you.